Hi everyone, I'm Grace Bennett. I'm the social media manager here at JDRF and I have been living with T1D for over 21 years. And we all know that T1D, whether you live with it, you're a caregiver, is a unrelenting day in and day out kind of thing and is a lot more complicated than a lot of people understand if they don't live with the disease themselves or know somebody who does. And today I am joined by Kale and Michelle Smith, who you might recognize from a post we shared back in March about their family's multi-generational experience with T1D. So first things first, I want to thank you both for joining us today and letting us kind of chat with you and ask you some questions about what your experience has been like. So thank you both so much for joining us. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. So my first question is for Michelle. So your brother was diagnosed with T1D when he was 10 years old. So yeah. what was that like for your family, your parents, his siblings? Take us through what it was kind of like to be a sibling of someone with type 1 diabetes. Well, you know, back then I was only eight years old, but, you know, from the things that I remember, uh, he was in the hospital for quite some time uh, what, when he was diagnosed. And then when he finally did come home, of course, you know, it was devastating for my parents uh, because, you know, they just weren't sure what life was going to be like, you know, with a type one, especially a young, a young man too, or a young kid. Um, but it was, you know, it was definitely a, a whole new way of eating, um, you know, and testing. And back then they only tested with, you know, they tested with the little urine bottles and the, and the tablets. So it was, you know, it's kind of hard to gauge exactly where they were. So my mother put a lot of trust in that she just did the right thing, you know, and prayed that he was able to make through the day and, and uh, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, and then when you met your husband, uh, he also lives with T1D. So kind of how did your experience growing up with your brother help you um, when you met your husband and, you know, kind of throughout your lives together? How did that kind of help you, you know, help him kind of walk through his life living with T1D as well? Well, we... have for one thing, he's he's always been a, a good, he eats anything that you put in front of him. <laughs> so we always try to be very, um, very conscious of what he ate. Um, plus, you know, testing at that time, um, you know, of course, he still was testing with, with the, you know, the urine testing, but they had, he had strips by that time. So um, he was using the strips. So we kind of tried to gauge it, you know, by that. And he did have an issue at one point, I think we'd been married probably, um, this was in 1982, uh, when Kale was born, we had an issue with uh, him having seizures. And so he had a seizure and then we, he, we had to take him to the hospital, of course. And then from that point on, he, he started using a glucometer, uh, which that was, I think, one of the first years that they came out with them. Um, and so he started using that. And of course, that did help to make life easier, you know, with him being able to test. Uh, fortunately, you know, they were pretty expensive at that time. I think they were running like $300. And so um, the people from his work went together and, and uh, was able to purchase one for him. Oh, wow. So then, you know, life just, you know, we still did the same things we've always done. Um, you know, by just eating well, and, and he always was good about that, and testing, you know, that was the thing. Yeah. All right. All right, Kale, you're, you're up. So you were diagnosed in 2014 with type 2 diabetes, uh, and kind of, you know, struggled, struggled along there until you went to an endocrinologist, you know, some years later, and were diagnosed with type one diabetes. So kind of walk us through that, what that experience, you know, was like for you receiving the type two diagnosis and, you know, growing up with a dad who had T1D, what was that? What was that like for you? Yeah. Um, certainly, you know, that diagnosis is always, 
a shock. It's a hard pill to swallow. It's, you know, it wasn't something I had expected. I thought, you know, I'm over 30 now. I'm, I'm past the, the prime window of things that have to do with diabetes. Type 2 happens when you're old. Um, and, you know, I don't want to call it Superman complex or syndrome. Certainly wasn't it. But, um, you know, it was deflating to, to hear those words. Um, you know, I, I just, again, it was tough to swallow. Um, I was already familiar with diabetes, obviously, and you know, what it entailed. And, um, you know, first thing is, oh, I'm not going to have to take shots. And I don't want to do that. I don't like shots. I don't, don't want to go through that process. Um, but the primary care physician I was working with at the time uh, said, well, you know, we can do pills and there's alternatives and all those things. Um, so that's where we started metformin, glimepiride uh, on a routine for that. And, you know, long story short, big roller coaster over the course of those years through trying things like um, Trulicity and then, uh, oh, I forgot the name of, Bidurian was one of the other ones that I tried, uh, mixing in Farsiga and some other, again, just random products throughout the course of that time. Um, after Jax was born 2016, um, you know, I started to care for it a little bit more. Um, we inevitably involved into a routine of using uh, some long acting insulin with the pills and so forth. Uh, and I thought, yeah, this is it. Things are going great. And then next thing I know, I'm, I, I didn't change anything. I didn't change diet. I didn't change uh, doses, nothing. And my numbers continued to, to grow and increase. And, you know, that point of frustration of you know, how much more can I do right and starve myself of the things that I, that I want? I want ice cream. I want pizza. Uh, you know, how, how much longer can I really go through that? Um, so once I got on board uh, with the endocrinologist, I just said, you know, the one that my dad uses, she seems pretty great. And, you know, his numbers are always good. So that's where I just, um, you know, what took so long? I, I don't know, stubbornness probably. Um, yeah. And then, you know, once I reached that point, everything changed and everything had evolved and, you know, another pill to swallow of pumps and those things. But with Jackson already in that phase of his diabetes with what he was going through it, I don't know. I was, I almost laugh when I say it, but I was kind of excited, you know, to go and get the same things that he had so that, you know, we could do it together. Um, and since that point, it's, you know, why I waited so long is probably one of the biggest mistakes I've ever made. Yeah, because your A1C came way down yeah. to like five. Yeah. So I said, why I waited so long is, is just beyond me. But uh, again, it was definitely a roller coaster for sure. Uh, and we're in a much better place now. Yeah, it's it's just so much. And, you know, your family there like we said, multi-generational. And you, you know, talked about your son, Jackson, who also lives with T1D. Um, and so how does, how does T1D and T1D management impact you two in the sense of, you know, work and school and all those kind of life things we have to balance on top of worrying about T1D and incorporating that into our everyday lives. How do you and Jackson, you know, at work and school respectfully, you know, respectively, how do you two kind of balance that and, and manage it? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think when I, when I, when I think back, when my mom talks about my uncle and my dad and those things that, you know, if I implant myself into that time frame today uh, with my, you know, five, six year old son being enrolled in school and somebody else caring for him. Whew, uh, I couldn't, I just couldn't imagine uh, the stress and the heartache, the constant worry that I would feel in, in regards to that. Now, it's not saying that I still don't, but having the abilities for things like the Dexcoms and so forth to where I know I could pull my phone, well, I could say I could pull my phone out now, but I could look to see exactly where his sugars are now. Uh, and know that every five minutes throughout the course of the day, exactly where he is. And we have the ability to, to communicate with our nursing teams at the school to simply send a text message that says, hey, I see he's low, he's had apple juice, he had some fruit snacks, or he's on his way to lunch, um, those things. So it really makes that part a lot less stressful. And I think it adds 
you know, more joy into his day where he's not having to constantly be poked and checked and prodded every five seconds. He can live like any other kid. Um, you know, it's a little more work in the morning to make sure that he's been bolus correctly before he goes to school and, you know, his lunches are packed, all his carbohydrates are written down on a piece of paper with his lunch and those things. But, you know, that's, it's routine. That's life. It's, it's normal now. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 yeah. My mom, um, you know, cause I have, I'm fortunate to have a Dexcom now, but when I was in, in school, CGMs weren't a thing quite yet. And so my mom always says, oh, if this would have made life much easier. Uh, I would have spent many fewer nights up worrying, especially when I was at college and, and all those things about, you know, if I was okay or not. Um, so Michelle, I want to bring it back to you because, you know, we, as people who live with T1D, obviously for us, it's day in, day out management can be super hard. But I think a lot of times, um, you know, we, we don't do as good of a job talking about the caregivers in, in our lives who are, you know, whether it's parents or grandparents, aunts, uncles, work colleagues, friends, whoever it is, play a huge role um, in, in the lives of people with T1D. And you've been a sibling, a wife, a mother, and a grandmother uh, to people living with T1D. So the big question here is, what do you do or what kind of things have you done over the years to help prioritize yourself? Because we all need a little me time um, and we all need to make sure we're taking care of ourselves. So how is someone who's played that caregiver role in many different capacities, how do you kind of carve out time for yourself and what things do you like to do when you need a little, a little me time? <laughs> oh, well, it comes far and few between, but um, I like to shop. You know, I mean, I like to go out to lunch. You know, I like to do all the things that girls like to do together. <laughs> when I get a chance. I do I like to do sister days. We my sister and I we do sister days now and then. And we go pamper ourselves. Yes. I well I think you you more than you more than deserve that for sure. Um and you know another question for both of you is you know we were talking about being able to see Jackson's numbers at school. How have you both kind of watched over the years as T1D treatments and technology and these developments have happened, you know, advances in research and things like that. How, how has it been to kind of watch those things develop and, um, you know, how has it impacted your lives and kind of the lives of your family in general, would you say? Well, for me, it's, it gave me peace of mind. I actually got night's sleep with this Dexcom. <laughs> And, and the, uh, you know, what we had a Dexcom, I think he had the first one, and I think it was 2002 for Loring. And it was just, I finally got a night's sleep, <laughs> which, you know, came far and few between as well. And, um, but it's nice to know, you know, when the alarms go off that, you know, that you, you it's waking you up. And the, that in, at night is when it was the best for me. You know, and him being away to if he was in the car or, you know, so that that really has made a difference for me. Just being able to get a night's rest and being able to know that, you know, all I have to do is look at my phone now and see where his numbers are. And I keep track of Kale and Jax, too, so that, you know, in the middle of the night, if something happens and they're low, I'm either getting a, a text saying, yes, mom, I had a snack or um, or from his, his Jackson's mother, if he's not with his dad, and to know that Kale, I can call and wake Kale up if I need to. That's my mom. Uh, I, have, I have sent many a text to her if she doesn't contact me in the middle of the night first that says, yes, I've had a snack. Um, <laughs> so she would, her answer would probably be the exact, exact same. Yeah. What about for you, Kale? Yeah. Um, you know, when I think about, not a, a lot is, I guess, for, my, for, for myself, but, you know, with my experiences with Jax, that, you know, upon initial diagnosis, having to, and it makes me kind of queasy thinking about it, but having to stick a needle in a baby, you know, at 
13 and a half months old and I have to, I have to stick him with a needle to give him insulin. I got to poke his little itty tiny bitty little fingers to check his blood sugar. Mm, it was, right. oh, it, it's a difficult thing to do. You know, it, you do it because it needs to be done. And, you know, it's, it's, it's for him, it saves his life and, you know, those things. So, you know, the physical act of, of doing it, no problem, but just try doing that without getting sick to your stomach. It's almost impossible. Uh, but because it's, it's just, it's your baby. But, you know, as he grew and he got old enough for, it didn't take long, you know, to where he could get a Dexcom and a pump, but it felt like 20 years, you know, over the course of what was really six months you know, or, or so, because again, you don't get that quality night's sleep. You're waking up at, you know, I think I did one, three, and five, and 6.30 was usually I'd, I'd wake up every night at those times just to check them, you know, was that overboard? Probably, but again, when you, it, it's, mm. you want to, you just want to stay awake all night and, you know, yeah. so that way to try to reduce the worry. Um, so bringing in the evolutions that we've seen with Dexcom, you know, and I, I've had conversations with uh, Danielle Slater, and you probably yourself too, Grace, the difference from that, the G5 to the G6, just that applicator itself, Tremendous. What a difference. You yeah. know, having to try to do a G5 on a baby mm -hmm. was just excruciating. But once that, again, just that simple change in applicator to the G6 made the biggest difference. Um, yeah. And we had started to hear rumor about Dexcom and Omnipod being able to work together with this Omnipod 5 thing. I'm like, oh, that would be incredible. We're already on that equipment. We don't have to change anything. and It'll just get better. And it did. You know, the nighttime lows, we could always count three, three thirty, somewhere in that mix. We were waking up because I had to give them juice or, you know, those kinds of things. And, you know, in the morning now, I would say it went from the norm to the rare, uh, and just that change of, of just that technology alone, but blood ketone meters, obviously the, the glucose testing, you know, I couldn't imagine living then mm -hmm. and trying to do what we're doing today. It just. Yeah, I can't. I cannot picture that. You know, and how blessed we are to, to be able to say that. You know, in, in today's world. So. Yeah, and it's so funny because I'm on the exact same um, setup and would get low at night around that exact same time between two thirty and three thirty usually. And yeah, getting um, after you know twenty one years to be able to say, oh, I actually got a full night's sleep and didn't have to wake up and eat something and then wake up and have the taste of food in my mouth. It's been, it's been incredible. Um, so it's, it's a, so much change and it's been great. Um, and so this is the um, portion of the show, if you will, where we ask all of our guests um, the same question. And we're so excited because we have both, um, you know, Kale, you live with T1D and as does your son. And Michelle, you are a, a seasoned veteran of, <laughs> of being around T1D. So the question I want to ask both of you is if you were to give one piece of advice to either a person that has just been diagnosed with T1D themselves or the parent of someone who's been diagnosed with T1D, what would that piece of advice be? Get on a pump and a Dexcom. That's, that's, yeah, that's, I love that. Short, sweet, to the point. Uh, it definitely makes things, you know, maybe not easy, but certainly easier um, than, than they were. Um, before we had before we had those options. What about you, Kale? Man, it's so hard to you know to, to bring it down to to one simple thing, um, especially without getting emotional. But really, at the end of the day, this is a, it's a shifting thing. There's never a single day that is going to be the same ever you eat the same thing every day at the same time, same amount. It, it's never the same. So I, I try to not think about those things. I try to think about to somebody that again, di that's recently diagnosed. It's not your fault. You didn't do anything. You didn't, you didn't do anything to deserve this. You couldn't have prevented it. Um, you know, your, your parents, yourself, your child, like it's not your fault and it's going to be okay. 
Yeah. And I, I think, um, you know, for me, the whole it's not your fault thing, the, the logical part of my brain, um, you know, and I'm sure my parents' brains know that it's an it's an autoimmune disease. It happens. Um, we're trying to, to figure out why the why and how um, of, of why it happens. But it's still it's still easier than you would think to slip into the mindset of, well, if I hadn't gotten, you know, sick or if I hadn't done this, that and the other, even though we know those aren't really factors um, in it, things we do, uh, it, it can be it can be tough not to get in the mindset of, you know, well, did I do something to deserve having to having to live with this? So I, I think that's great advice. Uh, Michelle, great advice from you as well. And thank you both so much again for joining us for answering our questions and to Michelle and to all the other amazing moms out there who help those of us who live with T1D manage it, stay on us, encourage us, help us. I could go on. We want to wish you all a very, very happy Mother's Day. And yeah, no. And thank you again both so much. Your family is so incredible. And we've loved getting to know you guys and, and learn more about your story. And to the audience, if you enjoyed this conversation, leave us a like, leave us a comment, throw us a follow. And if there's anyone you'd like to see us interview, send us a DM and we will make it happen. Thanks, everyone.